Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome back for another edition of Reasonable Doubt brought to you by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. As always, I'm your host, Jimmy Ardwan, here with my co-host, Julio Vela. You're looking good, man. You look like you've gotten some rest despite yeah. this new child. Your hair yeah. is combed. Your tie is cinched up. Yeah. You've got a nice suit on. It's Getting not back wrinkled. In, back in the saddle again. Looks like it's actually been to the cleaners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you seem to be doing well for having well, a newborn. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It <laughs> took me about a week. I'm still, I'm still gaining traction. Did your wife send you for a spa day? Say what? Did your wife send you for a spa day? Is that why you look? <laughs> oh well, well, you know, that's just. Uh, no. 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 Did you send her for a spa day? Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Good answer. Along with the rest of my good. everything. <laughs> Well, along with our refreshed co-host here this evening, ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to welcome to the program a good friend and a great lawyer at that, David Adler. Uh, welcome. It's been a while since you've been on, you were telling us. Uh, About 15 years. 15 years. Thanks for having me. Uh, Rob Fickman was the host the last time you came on. Rob Fickman was the host. I, I, I promise not to be uh, near as aggressive as him. That's just... <laughs> it's not hard to do. I can't replicate him. I just can't. No one can, um, thankfully. Yeah, I don't, I don't even want to try to imitate him. <laughs> but we're going to be here for the next hour talking with David, and uh, we'll take your phone calls. 713-807-1794 is the number if you want to get in on the conversation. You can also hit us up on Twitter at HCCLA underscore TV, and we'll take those questions and comments right here on the air. So, you know, um, just I, I think it's worth briefly mentioning uh, about this bail reform lawsuit that's been going on in Harris County, because we do have a little bit of big news today that the misdemeanor judges, uh, they settled the lawsuit. Uh, they signed the settlement, and in fact, they also issued a new local rule amending the bail schedule. And basically it looks like, you know, 85% about, uh, is the estimate that I'm getting, about 85% of people are going to be released on PR bonds. If, if, if everything, if everybody follows the local rule right. Uh, is that the same thing you're, you're hearing? Uh, um, what, do we have the local rule? I do. Uh, I, 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 we just, I think Judge Jordan sent it out late this afternoon. Um, and basically what it does, is it, it rescinds the initial bail schedule. Um, so the bail schedule for misdemeanor cases is gone. Uh, you know, if, if you'll recall, we had, a, we had a bail schedule that was posted on the district clerk's website that basically said it's this amount for these types of cases, this amount for this type of case, and went on down the line. Well, that's gone now. It, the, the, the money system is gone. And um, it says, first off, secured money bail must not be required as a condition of pretrial release prior to an individualized determination of ability to pay, and if the person cannot pay, consideration of alternatives and a finding that detention is necessary to meet a compelling government interest in either public safety or flight from prosecution. You know, the sad thing is that schedule never should have been created to begin with, and no. I don't know how many hundreds of years it's been there, but it never should have been in place, because what you just read is what the law has always required, an individualized decision. So that, that in my opinion, and, and I don't do nearly as much state court work yeah. as, as some other folks, but that schedule was a disaster and, and a disgrace for many, many years. Yeah, it totally was. I mean, in, in paragraph two, all misdemeanor arrestees must be released on a personal bond, i.e. unsecured bond, or a non-financial conditions, or on non-financial conditions as soon as practicable after arrest, except people who fall within, and they listed up a, 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 about, uh, let's see, what are six they? categories. Um, of, of ones that are excluded and people that couldn't be detained for 48 hours for an individualized hearing. And one is violation of protective order. Okay. I don't think anybody can argue with that. Nope. Uh, individuals arrested and charged pursuant to 2201. Uh, Assaultive. Right. Assault cases. Uh, second DWI cases where a person was convicted for a first DWI within five years. That's because they need conditions. Right. Uh, individuals arrested and charged with any new offense while on any form of pretrial release. Repeat offenders. Can't complain about that. No. Nope. Individuals arrested for not appearing in court at a court date while on any form of pretrial release. Flight risk. Case. Yep. And individuals arrested while on any form of community supervision following a conviction for a Class B misdemeanor or above. Probation violators. All pretty pretty standard stuff. And pretty reasonable. Yeah. Wow, so everybody's getting out. <laughs> so, I, it, the estimate I saw says that they think 85% of people. The, the danger, of course, is the backlash. So when the first stats come in of people who are failing to appear, 
people who oppose this change are going to be shouting from the rooftops that see this was a bad idea. So hopefully that number will be low. Hopefully people accused of these offenses will understand that this is really a sea change in how these cases are handled. Yeah. But I expect there to be a, a story or two in the newspaper or the news about, uh, okay, well, the stats are in and this percentage of people since the change are not showing up. I, I remember um, when the, the initial order first came out, uh, people were just getting released and released mm -hmm. and released and released. And then somewhere along the line, um, they stopped. They, st um, they stopped, and the jails began to get crowded and, and overflowing again. And now it seems like it's going back. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm interested to see how uh, it pans out. I'm really am because make no doubt about it. I mean, we've had shows on it where we would we would talk about. The individual be released and then picked up again and then released and then picked up again and released and picked up again. And I don't think that's going to be, I don't, that's not every case, but it does happen. And I'm curious to see how these group, this group of judges will react and address that issue because that's going to happen on some cases, not all of them. And I, I want to go on the record and say I think this is the right thing to do. Yeah. Period. It's the right thing to do. But I'm curious to see the response. Is it going to be like the old group of judges who just said, you know, forget this. We're just going to ring them back in. We're going to do or how are they going to to address that issue? Because it's going to happen. The, the other thing is, I mean, if, if the statistic, the prediction is correct um, and 85 percent of the people are going to get out OK, on misdemeanors, how dramatically is that really going to reduce the jail population? You know, you still got felonies um, that that are on a, as of right now, still on a bond schedule. Uh, the same thing has not been applied to the felony courts at this point. And one of the big controversies, of course, is the sending of uh, of pretrial individuals over to Louisiana right now that's going on, mm -hmm. um, pending trial. And so I, I wonder how much, okay, you're, you're, sending, you're saying 85% of people are going to get out. But I wonder, is it really going to have a dramatic effect on the jail population that it's been sold to have? Because I wonder how many people, I mean, the, the, the cases that get the attention, obviously, are the ones where people can't make the bond. Right. And they either end up committing suicide or they're killed by somebody else in the jail. And it's a tragic circumstance. So those are the cases that get the attention, of course. But I wonder how much of the population really is of misdemeanor cases. And I think the, the majority of population in the Harris County Jail is felony. Yeah, I think so too. I, if I'm not and mistaken, so, on, I, being held on pretrial, obviously. I, mean, I, I just don't know that this is gonna really make a difference. And, and you know, David, you and I practice in the federal system a lot, and I've compared, we've compared and contrasted on this program how the state court works versus the federal court, and it's, it's not apples to apples. It's oh. really an apples to oranges comparison because the numbers are so different. I mean, there's not nearly as many cases filed in federal court. Correct. And, and, and so, I mean, it's really easy for the federal courts to hold individual bond hearings for people. Right. Because there's just, there's not the volume. Well, and also the, the federal law requires, I mean, you know, there's a specific provision that, that requires a detention hearing yep. if, unless the defendant waives it. So, and that's why I said earlier, I think this elimination, the bond schedule was a in my opinion was a disaster. I don't know how long it's been in place. I would imagine 20, 30 years, maybe more. Yeah, at least with with changes in in the numbers, maybe over time. But but the idea that just because you're charged with this type of offense, you get this kind of bond, regardless of who you are, what your background is, what what good things you've done in your life, what bad things you may have done in your life. The the idea that there's a one size that fits all bond amount is is just disgraceful. In my well, opinion. it goes back to that old thing that we call the Constitution mm -hmm. and certain inalienable rights that each of us have, the presumption of innocence, uh, innocent unless, not until, but unless proven guilty. Um, I'm curious to know uh, who's going to be making these, uh, these, who's going to be doing, is it the, who's going to be having these bond hearings? So it, I would assume the magistrates are going to do right. that, but also if you read kind of and, and read between the lines and listen to what Judge Jordan and some of the other judges are saying, given their work schedules right now, 
I, I would, I think you might see some of the presiding judge judges sitting on on bond hearings or well, setting them for a bond hearing and bringing them to the actual courthouse rather than waiting for them to go to PC court. Well, and and this is something that I've always I've always wrestled with that uh, we have inmates or individuals who are accused of crimes who are brought up to court and they haven't been magistrated yet. They're referred to a 1517 hearing or referred to a bond hearing. And so I know that these individuals aren't all seeing magistrates before they get up to the county courts because we have to go then approach to, to discuss about a bond because they've been given a no bond. Yeah. They've been given just, it's, it's not even a no, it's just, it's, it's a refer to a 1517 hearing. And so somewhere along the line, they missed the magistrate, which they could have been two days ago, right? Uh, but instead they somehow missed that magistrate. Now we're in the county criminal courts and the, and the actual judge is having to, uh, to set that bond. So I'm wondering uh, if there's enough magistrate judges and, and why are some of these individuals missing that? And, 15, 17 hearing. And, and, you know, for a lot of these folks, missing one day because you're locked up can mean the difference between having a job oh, yeah. and not having a job. One oh, yeah. day, you know, yeah. we, we oh, all know yeah. there are bosses who are employers who just say, hey, I'm sorry you didn't show up. I got someone else. You're gone. Texas and that leads to a, a, a cascading series of, of disasters. Now he doesn't have a job, going to lose the apartment. His wife's going to get angry with him, perhaps, or the husband's going to get mad at her. Uh, you know, so it just leads to even one overnight in jail can lead to some very, very serious problems for these yeah. folks. And what I've also been seeing is um, there's uh, the, the Harris County District Attorney's Office is still arresting people for marijuana, uh, small amounts, less uh, class B, Mr. Marijuana times. Um, there's this big problem with driving while license invalids and, and big problem with petty thefts. Big problem with trespasses. These things are these low-level petty misdemeanors are still clogging up the system and are still um, are still causing this bottleneck of, of humans uh, to that distracts what I think. I mean, I guess this, uh, what I would believe the citizens of Harris County really should be focusing on, which is something else. I want, the, I'm sorry. I want to quickly say that um, Kerry Blakinger has has fact-checked me on Twitter. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, there there are no inmates uh, currently in Louisiana. Um, nobody has been outsourced right now. It's not to say they won't resume that practice. Uh, just like on the federal side, how they uh, store everybody up in Montgomery County. Variety of places. Uh, Variety of facility. places. I was at Fort Bend County Jail today on a federal yeah, case. Yeah, I know. Uh, looks like we have a phone call real quick. I want to take this call, and then we're going to uh, I want to brag on you after uh, we get done with this phone please call. Please don't. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Hi, thank you for taking my call. I just wanted to make a couple comments about um, the bail lawsuit and the new policies in place. Um, I think they said that there will be two judges on call for those hearings. I know that you guys had commented on um, you wondering how many magistrates there will be, but that's I think what they had said is that they'll have judges, judges on call. Then I just wanted to comment um, that this idea that putting down a couple hundred dollars or three hundred dollars um, as the old judges um, had commented that that would mean that they had some skin in the game <laughs> and would now somehow be uh, more um, uh, accountable to show up to court, I think is ludicrous. Um, and my last comment would be that I think this is a step in the right direction because um, most of the people that you're commenting about that are um, frequent flyers are returning um, in misdemeanor courts are tend to be underserved populations, homeless people, and mm -hmm. I don't think that PR bonds would, um, or not giving them PR bonds would somehow change that as we've mm -hmm. seen in the past. So um, thank you for your show, and I'll, I'll go off air now. Thanks. Thanks for the call. You know, one other thing about, I know I keep harping on how much I hated this, this bond schedule. Uh, I suspect the bond schedule was created back in a time when it was much easier to be a fugitive. You know, True. advances in technology, identification documents, license plate readers, it's not nearly as easy as it is, uh, not nearly as easy now to run from the police as it was maybe 40 years ago. Well, that's that's entirely true. I mean, how many cameras do we have in downtown Houston? Exactly. Facial recognition technology. Yeah. You know, now we have uh, law enforcement cars that have the license plate readers. They'll drive through a parking lot of a of an apartment complex and they'll just read 200 license plates in 15 minutes and if one's a stolen vehicle or is tied to a fugitive. So it's a very different world from yeah. when that bond schedule was created. The, um, 
the through the grapevine, it's uh, Daryl Jordan. I think it's not through the grapevine, but Daryl Jordan, Judge Jordan, and Judge Bynum have really taken the lead on some of these things. Yeah, well, that's I, what I hear. Judge Jordan, I think, was the only judge who was in favor of resolving this lawsuit quite a while ago, and would have saved the county quite a bit of taxpayer quite a bit of money. dollar. Can you imagine? Him. Can you imagine? Um, okay, so you had you had Judge Jordan in the face of the 15 other county criminal court law judges saying, no, this is wrong, and, you know, watch this, right? And then here comes the election. Now he's the senior judge at the misdemeanor courts. Mm -hmm. And this, this massive lawsuit that shook up the county, that made national attention, that was part of a national wave to reform the system, is, is now settled. Mm -hmm. And he has forever pivoted the way Harris County does yeah. things. That's pretty amazing, yeah, I think. I, I definitely think Judge Jordan is one of the primary heroes of this case, mm -hmm. to have the courage to, to do the right thing in, in light of 15 or so colleagues who disagreed with him. Um, obviously, I think Chief Judge Rosenthal over in the federal courthouse who's sure. here in this case uh, deserves a lot of credit, um, along with uh, you know the lawyers involved uh, on the plaintiff side, the, the uh, Laura and John Arnold Foundation, I know put a lot of effort into this kind of reform. So there are a lot of people that really stood up and did the right thing. The, the sad thing about it is it took so long and, and so many lives were devastated by this yeah. horrible situation for a long time. Yeah, it really is. And, and I mean, like I said, I'm going to be interested to see how much the jail population really gets reduced and, mm -hmm. and what this means going forward for everybody. You were talking earlier about uh, some of the pettier thefts, the marijuana. Has, in, has the district attorney's office made any comments about, because uh, I thought there was a whole push yeah. that they were going to reduce that yeah. kind of stuff. I'm, I'm starting to see marijuana is less than two ounces back in the mix. I'm, well, I mean, and, th and this is the new attorney general nominee has come out in his confirmation hearing and said he does not, if, he, if confirmed, he does not intend to prosecute um, S small, small amounts. Right. He is, is. He does not intend to infringe on the, the state's prerogative. The, yeah. Despite what uh, Sessions had done in pulling back the memo uh, and saying he was going to go after it, Barr has come out and said, "No, I'm. I'm. You know, look. As, as long as everybody's following the law and doing what they're supposed to do." You know, all of this comes down not even to politics, in my opinion. It comes down to scarce government resources. Right. And if you have one jail cell, would you rather have the guy who's sticking a gun in someone's ribs and robbing them in a very dangerous circumstance or the guy who's smoking a joint when he shouldn't be? Have you seen how people act when they smoke a joint? <laughs> I, I, again, I don't do as much state court work as you guys, but in, in 24 years, I don't think I've had a single client who has committed any other offense while smoking marijuana. Well, like no bar fights, nobody yeah. stabs their, their spouse. <laughs> no, no, no. The problem is they don't do anything. <laughs> but uh, No, but you know, it's, 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 it's strange, right? I mean, because I, I, I straddle both worlds. I mean, I'm probably in federal court more often than I'm in state court, especially these days. Um, but I've kind of straddled both worlds pretty evenly. And it is, it's the same, you know, it's like you're saying, David, I mean, who do you, who are you really concerned about, you know? And, and for a while there, what we saw in federal court was, you know, doctors and on these large healthcare fraud cases and everything. And these guys were getting, they were getting detained mm -hmm. for, for a while there. Yep. These guys were not getting bond. Mm -hmm. uh, and the belief was, oh, they've got so many resources, they're going to flee. Um, and like you said, where are they going to go? Well, one thing about federal court, though, uh, you know, I have many friends in the U.S. Attorney's Office here. This, I don't mean any disrespect by what I'm about to say, but they clearly use detention a a as a weapon. Oh. You know, it, it, it has a very big impact. I, I, I just had two very good results in cases in which both defendants were allowed out on bond and they got uh, through rehab on their own. They maintained their job. And we had a lot of good things to to present to the judge at sentencing. Had those both of those individuals been detained, all I could say is, well, they took two or three classes in the federal detention center, right? and, and that's it, judge. And well, so, and, and, and where it really happens a lot, and I'm sure you've seen it too, is in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act mm -hmm. cases. That's where it's abused so much. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is, is a statute that basically criminalizes uh, the bribery of foreign officials, mm -hmm. okay, in connection with getting a contract. And where it's obviously popped up a lot, in this town is through the oil and gas industry uh, in places like Venezuela and places like Africa, Brazil, Brazil um, you know, the, the Netherlands, places like that. And so um, 
what you see, and these are multi millions, tons of millions of dollars. Okay, so the, the dollar amounts are high, and, and like we've seen in other cases, the, the U.S. Attorney's Office will use the, the amount of loss because the sentence could be so high mm -hmm. as a justification to argue for detention. Mm -hmm. but, but what they've taken it a step further in these FCPA cases and basically have said, if you don't come in and cooperate, we are going to seek detention, seek detention on you. Yep. You go through a detention hearing, they make the argument that you've obstructed justice by trying to destroy evidence in the mm -hmm. case, put mm -hmm. on they'll find some witness who says, oh, he instructed me to shred documents or something like that. They get their detention. Then after six months of being in custody, your client says, you know what, okay, now I'm gonna cooperate. Mm -hmm. And the government says, okay, well, we'll agree to let you out on bond. Mm -hmm. Coincidentally, suddenly the, the risk of flight, flight and the danger of the community <laughs> has disappeared simply because you're gonna do what we want now. Right, yeah. and, and, it's terrible. And, and it's really happening in almost the majority of these FCPA cases. And, and as I think we all know, some of these cases can drag on for a year or more yes. easily. And so I think one of the questions um, many federal judges ask themselves uh, at sentencing is, what is the likelihood this person is going to be back in front of another judge in the future? And if you're detained, you really don't get the chance to show what you are like or what you can do now that you've had this problem. If you're released, you maintain your job, continue your education, continue your, your community work, you can present to the judge that this was an anomaly judge. This is not going to happen again. And so you, you really, the defendant has a much better chance of getting a reasonable sentence than if all they've been doing is, is locked up. Look, I, I don't really have much complaint about if, if the person's engaged in violence or has a history of violence. I certainly understand a judge saying we're going to have to detain you. Yeah. But for a business person or a low-level drug person, a courier or a driver, there's just no excuse other than it, it gives the prosecutor tremendous leverage over squeezing the person into accepting a, a plea agreement. And it really is not the way the law is supposed to be used. Well, and, and theoretically, that's what this bail schedule did, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Just not on such a um, overtly obvious mm -hmm. kind of situation is that, you know, the judges got, got together and, and decided this was going to be the bail schedule. The prosecutors also blessed it, mm -hmm. all knowing that this is a way that we can coerce pleas out of people. Mm -hmm because the majority of these people aren't gonna be able to make bond. They're not gonna be able yeah. to make these monetary bonds. And yeah. so guess what? We can move cases and we can get, you know, yeah. run the system. We always talk about the plea mill. Um, and cycle through them. Yeah. yeah. Just cycle through. I, I will say of, of an individual that's experienced uh, um, before and after this, this kind of change, um, if you're on bond, it is just a different world it's a different planet. Just uh, piggybacking on what you were saying is when you're on the free world, you're playing a different game versus when you are locked up, especially on this small kind of, I mean, they're not small because they, they affect some people's lives. But when you're dealing with, hey, you can take the deal now and get out of jail and go home and it's over versus if when you're on bond, you can say, you know, just come to court. Don't, don't have any violations. And at the end of the day, you know, while you can't guarantee you're going to be all right, I've seen this thing a thousand times, you're going to be all right, right? I mean, it's a big difference. And one of the things that I think only recently has started to be addressed is the, uh, you know, I think for many years people thought, oh, misdemeanor is not that big a deal to have it on your record. And I, I don't agree with that. I agree, mean, I yeah. There are many no. employers who will not hire you just yeah. for having a misdemeanor, whether it's a theft case, which is a little bit understandable, or a DWI or a marijuana case or misdemeanor assault. So the idea of holding somebody in jail until they plead to the misdemeanor just so we can get squeeze a few more bucks out of them, have another statistic, uh, it really leads to that cascading series of, of events that just cost the taxpayer much more than it should. Well, it fix the problem at a much cheaper rate, basically. Yeah, I mean, even just the arrest, uh, you know, if you get the case dismissed, but you're unable to afford to be able to get it expunged yeah. or non-disclosed or whatever, yep. I mean, just the, the arrest that's out there, yep. because it's, especially if it's an allegation of theft, yeah. You know, yeah. It's a, Who's going to hire you? World yeah. Who's going to hire you? Yeah. 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 And uh, you know, and the other thing I want to I want to talk about with you because we see it uh, particularly heavy on the federal side in the white collar cases, and and I think now also on the, you know, a lot of these um, robbery cases that are being mm -hmm. brought in the 924Cs, mm -hmm. um, the Hobbs Act cases, mm -hmm. for where they where they charge people with multiples uh, of these counts that can lead to a hundred plus year mm -hmm. sentences. Mm -hmm. All of these cases have significant amounts of discovery, uh, electronic discovery, video discovery, 
you know, with, with the white collar cases, you have boxes and boxes of terabytes of, of PDFs of, of financial records and stuff like that. When a client's detained, it's, it's virtually impossible to adequately meet with your client to review the discovery and, and have them help you in the defense. It wasn't so long ago that the Federal Detention Center, which is where pretrial detainees are held here in Houston, did not have a computer for reviewing uh, discovery or, or evidence materials. Um, they have one now and, yep. and have, one for, have, one for, have had one for a while. The problem is they have one. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure it's, it's probably happened to you where you, you go down there to meet with your client to review some discovery in the computer. The computer is tied up. And, uh, you know, in this day and age, there's no excuse for that. No. Um, so even if someone is going to be detained, uh, you know, some uh, amount of money, I would not be surprised if, if HCCLA or the or CJA lawyers or somebody came up and said, look, we'll, we'll gather up 500 bucks for another desktop. Um, but it doesn't work that way. There are all sorts of bureaucratic hurdles. But, especially with BOP. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are all sorts of downsides to having people unnecessarily detained pretrial. I don't think there's a defense lawyer in America who would say that no one should be detained. I think we all know we've, yeah. we've had clients who, because of their accusation against them or their history, that you, you don't have a very strong argument against detention. But we certainly have many, many clients who pose no threat to the community, pose no risk of flight, will be able to maintain their employment, will be able to meet with their lawyers to review the evidence in the case, and can make a, a good, well-reasoned decision on how they should resolve the case um, outside of jail. I, I want to ask you, um, have you seen, given the fact we're in nearly day 30 of this government mm -hmm. shutdown, and in mm -hmm. fact I was getting uh, email notifications today from various federal districts that they are staying all civil cases that the United States is a party in, and I'm sure the the courts here locally will do that. I was getting some from California and Louisiana mm -hmm. where they've done that. But ha have you seen here within the last couple of weeks, especially now, because the, the, the federal courts run out of money, I think, tomorrow, officially, um, is what I was told. I think I just read something t earlier today that said they have another little bit of cash that'll run them until next week or okay. so. But, but they're very close to running out. Are you, are you seeing the magistrate judges on the initial appearances, detention hearings, maybe give a little more consideration about whether or not to detain someone uh, because of the, of the situation? No, is yeah. the short answer. I have not seen that. It, it could be occurring, but um, I think we have a very good set of magistrate judges here, and um, they're looking at the two factors in the federal system, which is risk of flight uh, and danger to the community, and they're looking at those regardless of the economic impact. Um, as far as the civil cases here in, in the Southern District of Texas, my understanding is that it's been left to the individual judges to decide whether they should stay all of their cases, some of their cases, or none of their cases. But I do think we're in uncharted waters here uh, now that we're in the longest shutdown ever. I mean, I think there's going to come a point when it, it could affect criminal cases. Well, yeah, because, I mean, uh, the, the, the line so far that we've been getting is criminal cases are exempted. Mm -hmm. The prosecutors are still coming to work. They're not getting paid. Correct. Uh, the public defender's office is still going to work. They're not getting paid. And they may have to furlough some as well. Yep. Uh, the CJA vouchers are not getting paid. And you're the... You're the we're, <laughs> we're the first people they throw off the boat when, <laughs> well, when, the, when, the, when the problems you, come up. You, they you are the head of the CJA panel. The, the CJA uh, payments stop. Uh, They're the first ones to get cut. Yeah. Um, first. So the private counsel who are being appointed on indigent cases, they're not going to get their bills paid anytime soon. Correct. Uh, but they're still expected to show up. They're still expected to work their cases. And they will. Yeah. And they will. I mean, we, have, we have a great CJA panel in this yeah, town. I'm very proud of the fact that... Uh, I'm proud to be a part of it, and, thankfully. And we're proud to have you. But, but, you know, difficult judges, difficult clients, difficult prosecutors, no pay, and they will still be in there fighting their best for the Constitution and their, and their defense. So it, no doubt about that. Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, uh, so kind of what I've noticed is I had one trial um, where everybody was on bond, mm -hmm. got kind of pushed till February. Mm -hmm. um, now... Some of the other defendants, including mine, we resolved our, our portion of the case. Mm -hmm. And there's a question now whether the remaining defendants will even go in February. Uh, I had another case set in February. It's now been pushed off to May. The yep. defendants both were on bond there. Yep. The only case that I've seen where there seemed to be an urgency um, was in front of Judge Atlas where all the defendants were in custody. Yeah, I happened to watch that right. during the other day. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, you know, there was a trem there's, there's the, the government represented, there was a terabyte of discovery in that case. Which is, <laughs> which is astonishing to me, given the nature of that case. Right. <laughs> but it's still a significant amount to yeah. be reviewed in a couple months. Mm -hmm. um, 
and everybody's detained, so we're all going to be fighting for that one computer yep. um, to try and review it in 45 days, yep. 60 days, to get this case tried. But it, it did seem to me that, that aside from the normal concern that the judges have with people who are in custody, it seemed to me that Judge Atlas seemed to be really, really concerned on this case to make sure that nobody's speedy trial rights were prejudiced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, and, of the and, situation. you know, there's a whole other aspect to this shutdown, too. I mean, uh, BOP has had significant staffing shortages before this shutdown. Now, uh, BOP people are calling in sick because they're not getting paid. And yeah. so you have secretaries and teachers and clerical staff who have been turned into guards, uh, which can create sort of a dangerous situation for inmates and, and BOP personnel as well. So we haven't really seen any flare-ups that I'm aware of at this point, but if this goes on for another couple of weeks, I could see a situation where some violence happens in the, in the federal prison system because they don't have enough people to supervise, and the people who are being asked to supervise don't have the training to do so. Yeah. I mean, so. at, at what point do you think that the U.S. Attorney's Office is forced to you know, possibly say, go to the judges and say, you know, we can't, we can't operate. That's a really good question. Where, um, where do they, where, where, I mean, maybe that's a question for Ryan Patrick, a better question for him. But I mean, if you were to guess, I mean, do you, do you have any kind of guess at, w at what point do they say, well, I'm I, sure we can do this. I, I think, again, I think the federal prosecutors are a by and large a dedicated bunch and, and they recognize that they are expected to work. I don't think you're going to see people quitting the office yet. No. It would have to go on for months. six months yeah. before someone would say, hey, I just I can't afford this anymore. Um, whether they either intentionally or unintentionally reduce the intensity of their desire to work because they're not getting paid. I, that's probably a natural reaction. You know, I haven't gotten paid in three weeks, and so maybe I'm going to show up at 9.30 instead of 9. Yeah. So that, you know, all of this can affect the intake of cases and the processing of cases. But as you said, at the end of the day, there are speedy trial rights in federal court, um, thank God. And, uh, you know, if, if uh, the, the Constitution does not make allowance for the fact that, well, the prosecutors haven't gotten paid, the marshals haven't gotten paid, the federal public defender hasn't gotten paid, so we're going to delay this trial beyond what the Speedy Trial, calls, uh, the Speedy trial Act calls for. So, it, like I said, this is, this is new territory here. I don't think anybody really knows what's, what's going to happen. Would right. you all say that there's more, fed, more county cases or state cases that are filed than, a fed, than federal cases? In this Just county? in general. Or across right. the country? Oh, certainly, in, yeah. We have a very busy... Uh, criminal docket in the Southern District of Texas, but it's yeah. nothing compared to the Harris County court I mean, system. I, I would think Harris County, uh, well, I know, I mean, Harris County files more cases than the entire Southern District yeah, combined, by, and that's by stretching far, way down yeah. the border. I mean, you know, when you, as you well know, you go to Harris County Courthouse any day, Monday through Friday, any day of the year, pretty much, there are going to be courtrooms full of people. Mm -hmm. That's not what happens in federal court. Uh, you, you know, it's very rare that you'll walk in and there'll be more than at the most, maybe eight or ten cases on the docket, right. and and that's very rare. A lot of times, you're the only case on the docket. Well, so. Why do you suppose that? Because I'd imagine there's just as many federal laws that people can violate as there are state laws. Well, yeah. I mean, the joke is, I mean, you could literally you could find a federal offense that all of us have violated at some point. Correct. Uh, because yeah. they've codified so many things to be a crime. One one thing, one answer to your question, I think, is the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office here for many, many years has stayed away from prosecuting misdemeanors. There are a whole series of federal misdemeanors. They don't really, I think that's a proper use of taxpayer dollars. They don't really go after federal misdemeanors. What would be an example of a federal misdemeanor? Uh, certain amounts of drugs, you know, I mean, it's very similar to state court, but they do process, um, there are prosecutors who are reluctantly assigned to handle things like a speeding ticket in a national park or mm -hmm. on the VA hospital <laughs> or something it, like well, that. Well, it happens a lot more down in Corpus Christi, yeah. where you have the national the seashore, yeah. where people will get, uh, you know, because they are the only jurisdiction for the federal, uh, federal lands. Federal yeah. lands. Yeah. And so there's not really a whole lot of federal lands here. Well, but we do have, we do have NASA some. and we do have the Veterans Correct. Hospital. So you'll see, I mean, it's called the CVB docket. Yep. Um, and, you know, uh, f as you might imagine, some of the federal magistrates view this these kinds of offenses with the appropriate um, wait? degree of, yeah, wait, <laughs> yeah. you know. So, I mean, come on, it's. Uh, I, I'll never forget, I had a DWI case, a federal DWI case down in Corpus Christi that I got hired on. It was on the national seashore. Mm -hmm. uh, not surprisingly, there might be some intoxicated people on the beach in Corpus Christi mm -hmm. who decide to tool around in their cars. 
Um, and it ended up being a federal case, but I ended up getting the case dismissed because the federal agent who made the arrest filled out the DWI paperwork, the DIC 23 and all that sort of stuff. Probably never done it before. Ne clearly had not because <laughs> he certified that he was a sworn Texas peace officer. No, and he was not. And he was not. And so I, uh, I looked at that and I went to the AUSA. I said, hey, uh, your, your boy swore that he was a certified Texas peace officer. I'm pretty sure he's not. He's like, yep, this case yeah. is gone. You know, for, for federal prosecutors who are by and large have more experience than state court prosecutors, a lot of them are former state court prosecutors, they don't really look at that CVB docket, whether it's a, an alcohol violation or a speeding ticket or a yeah. game, game violation, you know, hunting. And, they don't really look at that as a good use of their time, and, and they're going to try to resolve those very, very quickly. So if there is a defect... Um, that they can rely on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're going to they're gonna want to go back to what they view as more serious problems for the community, which is appropriate in my opinion. So. Do you think that's, that that's an attitude that maybe state courts, state, state prosecutors, state prosecutor's office should should kind of think about? You know, it, it, it depends on your opinion. I mean, obviously, municipal court, just as one example sure. here, it's a big money-making engine for the city of Houston. And so if you were to go down there and, and ask a prosecutor, hey, these are kind of pissant charges, you know, speeding and yeah. you know, inspection sticker expired, you know, they're not going to walk away from those things because it's generating revenue for the city. So I want to ask you about non-pissant charges at this point um, because we've kind of got a, a pretty sizable one going on in D.C. right now. Uh, with the special counsel's inv investigation. We've seen a number of charges. We saw, we've seen one trial in Manafort. Uh, that ended up in a plea uh, mid-trial. Um, no. Well, I mean, after the verdict. Yeah, he pled to the... I thought he, he pled... He, he yeah. was guilty, found guilty by the jury on one, and he pled to the Correct. second series yeah. of charges. Okay. So, ba ba you know, he had the two cases pending, and basically, before they could get to the second one, I, right. I, I kind of mis misspoke a little bit, but... I didn't want Carrie um, to to tweet you. I know. So correct me again. <laughs> um, getting a little ahead of myself. But um, now this week we've come out and the president's lawyer has said, uh, well, I didn't say there was no collusion. Yeah. It's been <laughs> it's been an interesting defense strategy. And you and I were talking in the show about about some of the missteps that a lot of the lawyers have made in this thing. I, I am absolutely astonished at the high dollar lawyers who have made some enormous errors. Um, and I don't know what is causing it, but it, it has been um, a, a very unusual string of, of mistakes. In fact, the Atlantic Monthly Magazine just did a story on all of the, or many of the problems, and I don't know what's causing it, but I've not seen anything. I remember when we had the Enron prosecution down here, uh, I don't recall any, any missteps at all, and that was a pretty high profile case. We had some very good lawyers, both at the high end of the cost and low end of the cost yeah. scale. And, uh, you know, maybe I'm just proud of the Houston bar and uh, <laughs> laughing at the Washington, D.C. bar, but I am just astonished at some of the mistakes, whether it's failing to redact something sensitive or the president's two lawyers, uh, Ty Cobb and the other guy who were talking at lunch one day loud enough that the New York Times or Washington Post reporter who was sitting at the next table heard everything they were talking. I mean, these are like law school 101, you know, keep your confidential information confidential. Yeah. And... Uh, I'm sure we're going to see more. I'm going to see more. And, and the, I think it was with Cohen when the president's former lawyer pleaded guilty. There were all these sort of backpedaling just before the sentencing hearing. I didn't really do what they're saying. I mean, we all know that's a rookie mistake. I mean, you, right. you know, and that's, after you've pleaded guilty is not the time to try to minimize yeah. what you've admitted doing. Right. So, I, I want to ask you about that because, I mean, we've seen all these pleas. I mean, and these pleas are very, very different from what we see every day. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, when I first got the plea agreement on Flynn's case, when I pulled it, Michael Flynn's mm -hmm. case, mm -hmm. I was just stunned. I mean, I had never seen a plea agreement like that yeah. in my life, yeah. uh, where he's basically, the plea agreement sets forth a guideline range of zero to six months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you don't seen, see a whole lot like that, huh? No, I mean, I'm, I've never well, seen anything like that. So I think there are a couple of factors at play. Uh, um, number one, Flynn obviously has decades of service to the country. Sure. Apparently he lost his mind in the last few years, but but you know he has served honorably for many many years, so that that probably had some impact. But I also think uh, you and I are used to practicing in the Southern District of Texas, and whether it's Ryan Patrick uh, or any of his predecessors, know, any of his predecessors. I mean, this is a pretty harsh district. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty tough district. They're not known nationally for sort of 
being uh, reasonable in their negotiations. Lawyers come down here from other districts and, and they're they have sticker shock. Yeah, they're shocked, uh, right. And so, so, you know, Washington, D.C. may be a little more, there may be a little more flexibility built into the bureaucracy up there. I don't know. But, but I also think there's the possibility, um, and maybe there's a, a parallel or an analogy, we have seen, you and I have seen cases where the initial arrests that lead to the bigger fish those initial people get better deals. Sure. So there may be some more harsh sentences coming down the road. Yeah. Um, whether you agree with that politically or not, it's a different story. But, but I think there, there is the, the chance of some much more uh, hard. If you notice from Flynn to Cohen, you know, it's gone from zero to six to it's three years. Yeah. yeah. It's and getting so progressively up the chain. Potentially, the, potentially. Yeah, the old saying, first one in gets the best deal kind of thing. But, uh, but even still, Cohen... At three years, that's still a pretty good deal. It's a very good deal. From, from, from what he was exposed to, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, Papadopoulos getting six days. Correct. Uh, the, right. the, the lawyer getting, what, 10 days yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah, but again, I, I attribute, I'm guessing, yeah. but I attribute that to these guys are the building blocks to sure. bigger problems that are being addressed by Mueller or the Southern District of New York. Or, right. And, 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 in, in keeping with that, the building blocks kind of thing, there's always been this this kind of undertone in federal cases where you will see um, certain guys get a bigger time cut or a better a better deal where they get a, a, a cap that's more favorable to then start working off of, a five-year cap, a 10-year cap, as opposed to the 20-year cap or pleading to a statute that, that has a much lower um, potential range of punishment under the guidelines. This, this whole notion that the U.S. Attorney's Office can manipulate the guidelines, so to speak. They absolutely can. And they can. And, I, you know, we've both seen it where we were talking before the show about how the office, a lot of the offices now go after the low-hanging fruit. Um, but they don't really give that low-hanging fruit. A low-hanging sentence. Correct. Yeah. And it, it's, it is a counterintuitive situation where the people who have committed the most offenses of course, have the most information because they were most, they, they were... Senior in the organization. Exactly. Yep. And they get the biggest time cut, whereas the guy on the low end, who doesn't know anything, ends up getting a much harsher sentence in some cases, mm -hmm. or, or, or proportionately harsher sentence to what yeah. the other guys got. I, I think uh, this is one of those problems that the guidelines were uh, designed to fix. I don't think the guidelines have no. fixed them. Um, but the classic example would be the cartel higher up who knows a lot of information about the tentacles of the organization uh, and thus when he gets caught is able to cut a very good deal based on his cooperation versus the courier who just drives the car from point A to point B doesn't know anything other than you know this guy gives me the car and I drive it and park it here and so when he tries to cooperate the prosecutors and the agents can sort of sniff and say we don't you know that's not really helpful to us. So the guidelines were supposed to fix that. I don't think they have, but I will tell you what I do think has happened is many federal judges um, have come to understand that there are some structural problems with the guidelines, that, that the underpinnings of the guidelines um, maybe were well-intentioned, but in practice um, have not worked out so well. And so I think judges now have much more flexibility, and, and I think all of us have had uh, various cases where we have success saying to the judge, yes, judge, my guy is a low-level courier, mm -hmm. and that means he wasn't able to provide the information that would get him a 50% reduction in, in sentence. And I think judges, uh, at least in our district, thankfully, many of the judges are sensitive to those kind of arguments. Yeah. Or no, receptive I, to those kind of arguments. I think you do see that more and more these days, is that um, you see the judges really exercising their discretion a lot more than they used to. And, and I think... I think it's going to be interesting to watch the newer crop of judges, and we're getting a bunch in the Southern District, who are coming into office or the bench uh, under the regime where the guidelines are not mandatory anymore. I think right. there's, I think someday down the road there will probably be a statistical analysis of the sentences imposed <coughs> by judges who were appointed post Booker, which was the case that said the guidelines are not mandatory, um, and judges who were appointed before when the guidelines were uh, mandatory. When does that case come though? Oh my gosh, that was uh, I don't remember 2005, 2006. Like that. Yeah. I think. Do you, uh, and so are do you still see judges? There are, to them? Yeah, the there are. There are. There are absolutely judges throughout the country that that still 
uh, view the, the guidelines as almost a, a Bible-like text. And, and I think it, it, one of the problems with the guidelines was it, it gave judges cover for giving a sentence that mm -hmm. may otherwise be harsh, regardless of whether you're liberal or conservative, the judges could say, well, that's what the guidelines call for, and so that's what I'm going to do, um, which I think is entirely inappropriate. But I think the guidelines provided cover for a lot of that kind of activity. Now that they're not mandatory, they're just advisory, whatever that actually means, uh, it's a little more difficult to the for the judge to say, well, that's what the guidelines call for. Because what they're supposed to do is consider the guidelines, but then make an independent evaluation of what is an appropriate sentence. Yeah, and it's not like the circuit courts of appeals really help. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> obviously the Fifth Circuit is, is not known for it's being one of the more pro-defendant no. um, circuits. Not at all. <laughs> you know, we, we do have some good judges over there as well. We so. do, but but they are still a not a pro-defendant circuit, no. that's for sure. No. And, and you talked about sticker shock earlier when out-of-town lawyers come to Houston. The same thing happens at the Fifth Circuit. Oh, that, yeah. Uh, Sure. I, I had a case recently where one of the lawyers involved in the case was from California in the Ninth Circuit, which is probably the polar oh. opposite of the Fifth Circuit. And uh, he called me at one point as we were working on the briefs, and he said, you know, I'm reading this Fifth Circuit case law, and I just, I can't believe it. <laughs> the only thing I'm happy about is that I don't practice in the Fifth Circuit on a regular basis. So, Yeah, my favorite Fifth Circuit opinion was when they said, you know, talking about the cell phones. Oh. No, my, not the sleeping lawyer one. That, that's obviously a good one. But my favorite of the most recent ones was talking about cell phone technology and, you know, searching of cell phones and search and seizure. And, and basically they said, well, you know what? You have the option not to get a cell phone. Yes. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's 2015. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't really have the option to not have a cell phone. these Well, days. And, and that's like uh, some of the child pornography guidelines have come under tremendous criticism because basically every defendant is eligible for almost every single enhancement. And one of the enhancements is an additional two points in your offense calculation, offense level calculation for using a computer. <laughs> and, and many lawyers will argue, you know, judge, the, to the, offense. The, the days of buying a dirty magazine from Sweden and having it mailed here are long gone. <laughs> you, you might as well give an extra two points for breathing oxygen. I mean, you know, and, and again, I think we have a very good set of judges here, thankfully, who say, yeah, I'm not going to give him that extra two points for using a computer because it's become part and parcel of, of everyday life. So. Yeah. And, and in fact, the only way that offense is committed, it seems yeah, like. Yeah, I have it. not seen a printed material child pornography case in, in um, over 20 years now. You know, I, I joked the other day uh, that if you want to see somebody reading an actual newspaper, mm -hmm. go to your leg extension machine at the gym. Because that's, that's where you seem to find everybody just hanging out, you know, doing leg extensions and reading the paper. You it's go to a different gym than I do. Because I don't even see it at the, I don't even see it at the gym that I go to. What's I've, a gym? I've seen it. <laughs> You don't have time for it. Oh man! Uh, I want to brag on you for a little bit um, because, as I said, you're the you're the head of the uh, the panel rep for the yeah, Criminal no, Justice Act panel here, and you know you have helped so many lawyers, uh, including me, and and you answer the phone every time somebody has a call uh, and has an issue that comes up on the panel, has a question about something, and uh, you were you were recently given by the Federal Bar Association the the first. Uh, Thomas Reevely Award uh, for your service, and um, I mean, it, I, I was at the dinner when you got it, and uh, it yes. was it was tremendous to see you get it. Thanks. It, it, it is um, it is probably the high point of my career. I think it's all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have to clarify one thing: it, it, although it was presented at the Federal Bar Association dinner, which is very nice of them to accommodate, it actually was it's an award from the Southern District of Texas. Yeah. So that's why it means so much to me that the judges actually decided. Right. Um, you know. Maybe the decision was let's give this to him and hope it shuts him up. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, but but you have been intimately involved with the Criminal Justice Act panel for a, a long, long time now. Yeah, this um, is uh, nine years. Yeah, and uh, you've you know you don't hesitate to uh, step up and take a case. Uh, you don't hesitate to help young lawyers or any lawyer that's on it. There, with, there's too much at stake. There, yeah. There's just too much at stake. Uh, you know. Um, before I was a criminal defense lawyer, I spent some time working for the government overseas, mm -hmm. and I, I was in some uh, civil war environments. And it, although I had my law license then, uh, I had not really practiced uh, any criminal law, but I was astonished at the ferocity of the former government officials. Now, this is a civil war environment, where so there's no rhyme or reason as to what's yeah. going on. It's just complete violence. 
but the former government officials, they didn't have a monopoly on the violence, but they certainly were among the worst perpetrators. And I'm not, uh, I don't expect that to happen here, and I'm not saying sure. anybody who works for the government here would... would Even as long as the shutdown goes yeah, on, exactly. I, we don't anticipate that. But I, I do think a lot of Americans don't realize how important keeping the government in a box is. And one of the things that, I'm not from Texas originally, one of the things that, that sort of disappointed me uh, when I first came down here was Texas has this sort of independent, free-spirited attitude. But for many years, the jury pools were just in lockstep with whatever a police officer said. Yeah. They would buy it hook, line, and sinker, whether it was state court or federal court. And I do think that's changed, thankfully. But I just remember thinking, you know, this is Texas, where they're proud of their independence. We're proud of our heritage here. And uh, But if a, if a police officer said in August that it was snowing outside, you'd get about eight people on the jury saying, hey, that's crazy, but if a police officer says it, I believe it. And again, I'm not saying all police officers lie, but the role of the juror, the role of the individual citizen is to be uh, critical of the government's case. You know, think carefully about it. Don't just buy it hook, line, and sinker. And so I enjoy working on, on the indigent defense cases because um, it gives me a chance to try to keep the government in that box. I don't think the government is our enemy, but I don't think it's our friend either. I think it's a necessary evil. And yeah, I mean, the irony is this country was founded on a complete distrust of government, mm -hmm. right? Yep. I mean, that's, that's the whole purpose for the way the Constitution was written, why the Electoral College is in place that everybody is, yeah. is criticizing, yeah. why, why we have so many of the things in place that we do, why we have two, you know, we ha why we have a House and a Senate, mm -hmm. why the president is limited in terms, mm -hmm. you know. W we have these things because the Founding Fathers had such a distrust of government. Mm -hmm. and, and what is scary, and particularly I think even more so in federal court than in state court with the juries, is that you have almost a non-existence, healthy even, distrust of government. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of people, even when you question them in jury selection, will say, eh, if an officer says it, I, I, I have to believe it's true. Yeah, I, I think a lot of that is driven, unfortunately, by the media's constant drumbeat of crime is everywhere. Crime is outside your door. Crime is in Kingwood. Crime is in Friendswood. Crime is everywhere. And the statistics show that it's not the case, that crime has been dropping for well over 20 years now. Yeah. I mean, there are certain years where some particular crime will go up, but by and large, it's a much safer world that we live in as far as crime now than it was 20 years ago. But if I, I didn't, I don't watch local news anymore, but if you turned on the local news tonight, I guarantee you one of the first three stories will be some criminal activity. And it makes jurors frightened. And I think they take that fear with them into the courtroom and it's very hard to separate that fear that they may feel unreasonably or without basis from the defendant who's sitting there. And it gives them a, a chance to vent their fears and say, well, the evidence wasn't so strong here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna vote guilty just to get this guy off the street. And that's not the way it's supposed to work. No, and I, I think the hard part in federal court particularly is, you know, you get a lot of these drug cases, you get a lot of the violent crime cases, the Hobbs Act cases that we're talking about, it's really not a jury of your peers. Oh, absolutely. Because in federal court, they're pulling from such a much broader area. They're pulling from Brazos County, they're pulling from Fort Bend County, they're pulling from, you know, Montgomery County. I mean, they're, they're pulling from all over the, the Houston division mm -hmm. of the Southern District of Texas, which is so much wider than just yeah. Harris County. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, they also do it by voter registration, not by just driver's license. Right. And right. so you end up with a- Very skewed. A very skewed jury pool. You know, Judge Hittner over in federal court, I don't know if you've seen the poster he has hanging outside his courtroom, but it says a jury of your, it's an encouragement to serve on jury duty. Yep. And it's got a, I think it's 12 dogs in a jury box and the cat is in the defendants. Yeah. And it says a jury of your peers, question mark. And I, I, you know, I suspect you've had the same experience where you go into the courtroom and the judge is white, the court reporter is white, the bailiffs are white, the defense lawyers are white, the prosecutors are white, the jury's white, and the defendant is not white. Correct. And you know, that I do think, uh, you know, the race card is not something that to be played lightly, but I do think that has an impact. I joked with a, a former federal prosecutor who's retired now uh, when I raised that one time uh, when we had picked a jury and I'm like, you know, my guy is not white and look at the jury. And he kind of poo-pooed it. And I said, well, how would you feel if everybody in this courtroom was not white and you were the only white guy here? Would that bother you at all? And he thought about it for a second. And to his credit, he said, yeah, that would be an unusual circumstance for me. Mm -hmm. Try it when so. I, and then your, your lawyer's Mexican. <laughs> You're like, oh, wait. Yeah, I mean, it's palpable, man. I mean, we talked about it last week. Yep. I mean, it's, it's, those kind of things are real. Um, 
I'd li we'd like to think it's not, but it is, you know, and I, I think at least uh, are the, the staff and the colleagues and the lawyers and the judges, I, I think, uh, are with it. But when you pull in 60 people from your community, from the community, and, you know, in, in my understanding, the problem for, it can be. I don't know if the problem still exists in state court. Maybe you guys can speak to it. But the grand jury system was even worse. It was, you know, where right. you had judges basically picking, I guess, individual grand jurors, and yeah. so you you would have even less of a random randomized selection on the grand jury. Um, so I don't know where that stands now, but I hope at some point that's not the case anymore. I mean, it really should be random, but it should be statistically representative of, you know, race ethnicity, you know, uh, all, all of the things that, w that make Houston such a great city, it's diversity. You don't want to have just 12 people who fit one particular profile deciding what should happen in a particular case. It's just not good for the community. It's not good for the system. It's not the way it's supposed to work. Yeah. Real quickly, I want to ask you, since you, since you are the panel rep, um, you know, there's a lot of criticism about the way lawyers are appointed on the state side to things because, you know, the way the judges are involved with and everything else. But, but the judges are involved on the federal side, too. Um, why do you think that the CJA panel works so much better in the federal system than, it, than the appointment system of private attorneys in the state system? I don't know much about the system in state court. I do know there have been complaints uh, about it over the years. I know there was some concern when the Harris County Public Defender's Office was put in place. But I think to answer your question directly, a lot of it comes back to the scale that you're dealing with in Harris County versus the federal courts. We have, in the Houston division of the Southern District, we have about 100 lawyers on the panel. And we've screened them pretty carefully to make sure they have the, yeah. the qualifications and the, the desire to represent, because it's not an easy job, as you no. know. I mean, any defense work is not easy, but indigent defense is particularly difficult, in my opinion. Um, and I think we have a very good system, largely because um, the magistrates who, by and large, do the appointments, will try, they'll size up a defendant, they'll size up a case, and they'll try to match that person with a lawyer whose experience and qualifications would be a good fit. So for example, if you have the lead defendant in a multi-defendant drug case, complex, you know, multiple jurisdictions, gonna be a lot of discovery, the magistrates know we're not going to give that to someone who's been on the panel one or two or three years. They're going to give it to someone like Jimmy Ardwan because he's got the experience to handle that. Yeah. On the other hand, um, you know, if it's a simple felon in possession case, well, that is going to go to somebody who um, Just, has, uh, yeah. yeah. And so I think, you know, we have, uh, we're very fortunate with the magistrates that a couple have retired recently, but the ones we have now also, they try to match up. Um, what lawyer is appropriate for this case and this defendant. Um, some lawyers are better dealing with someone who's got a mental illness. Um, uh, so, you know, all those kind of issues, I think that's the answer is the magistrate judges do a good job of, of sizing up the case and the lawyer. We are out of time, my friend. Sorry. I appreciate you coming on. No, no, no. I, I wanted to get that answer you said in. said it goes fast. It does go fast. And <laughs> we, we have used up all of our available time. Fair enough. So, uh, I want to thank you all for joining us this week, and I want to thank our guest, David Adler, for being with us. It was a pleasure. And uh, Julio, I hope you continue to get the rest you need, and maybe your wife will give you that spa day you deserve. <laughs> 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 we will see you next week, ladies and gentlemen, for, for another edition of Reasonable Doubt. Good night. Congratulations. You're first. Fourth. Oh, my God. You're a